today we're going to have a lecture on uh, developing and planning quality early childhood education programs and then the next uh, video lecture will be on choosing curriculum and how that informs the leadership of our programs as well. So we're going to be talking a little bit about why we plan and the types of planning that you can do in. I mostly focus on yearly planning. Um, we'll talk about time management and probably your monthly planning or your weekly planning later on in the class as we kind of finish. But the beginning of this course is kind of a macro level. It's very large talking about bigger issues that might affect your program like leadership and mission statements, diversity, um, and then it kind of in this lecture focusing on the larger level scales of planning. Even if you have a small program really thinking um, forward about the types of planning that you need to be putting in. Some other things that might affect your ability to plan will be the type of program that you run. Um, so if you're federally funded, state funded, um, if you're funded by county programs or the county of education or something like that, or if you get your um, funding from a board or if you're a private organization, your funding sources really uh, can, can change the amount of planning that you have to do as well. Typically, if you receive any kind of public monies, you also have to engage in processes of assessments or accreditation or some kind of um, responsibility to the, the, um, the, the organizations that fund you. Um, so you typically have to build that into your program is, what do I have to do for these people who have given me money? Um, or if you're a private organization that has a board, boards typically um, also want information from you at certain times. And so that will go into your planning as well, knowing when due dates are coming up and things like that. Also, if you do engage in any kind of um, uh, like accreditations like NIAC or QPI, um, that will also in, um, inform your uh, the, the trainings that you do and then just the way the planning that you need to do as well. We will talk a little bit about the fact that most planning is very proactive. Um, you want to be looking forward, you want to know what your grand plan is, you know who you are as a leader, you know what your vision is, and you're going to head towards it through really quality planning. But this is still childcare, and we still have children that we are responsible for, which means that we also have families that we answer to. And we also have licensing as well. And that makes us very reactive to things as well. We don't ever know. We might have the best plan when we go into our classroom or into our center on a day. Um, but then if somebody breaks their arm or half your staff calls out sick with a stomach flu or, you know, this or that, you're going to have to be reactive and you might not get to the things that you needed to do as well. Same with your month. So, you know, with a caveat to all the things that I'll be talking about um, in the rest of this lecture, um, sometimes your best laid plans do not work out. You know, sometimes you have all these things that you're going to achieve in January, but if January was a total crapshoot because you had licensing come and then you had three teachers quit and then uh, you had things that you weren't expecting budget wide, like it just did not happen. That's totally fine, but that's why planning and over such long scale, it can be so helpful. If January didn't work out, you still know what you needed to achieve in January. You can just roll it into February and then hopefully kind of have a better February and be able to get back on track. It's never being able to get on track and always being surprised about money that's not there or, um, oh my God, I'm getting accredited again. Like that, that type of type of stuff shouldn't be a surprise to you because you're well aware of it and you've planned it into your year. So I, why I kind of take this, uh, this is my third week. Like I said, it starts at a very macro level. So we've been writing our mission statement and we've been talking about um, diversity and mission and things like that. So now we need to take that vision and we need to put it into action. And this is the process of putting it into actions. Depending on the program that you are, where your funding source is, what kind of children you serve, what ages you serve, the hours that you're open, that's going to inform your planning because you're gonna have markedly different goals. An FCC provider that's a small family home with only four children is going to have very different goals than um, a military education center that can have 300 to 400 students um, on a daily basis. That doesn't mean that one is better than the other. They are still incredibly valid programs and they're on the same level of validity. They are just going to have very different goals. Um, and I do want to have a caveat as well. A lot of times I hear, well, I'm state funded. Well, I'm Head Start. 
yes, that they, you're going to have your mission statement written for you, or if you're YMCA or anything like that. Yes, these are very large organizations. They have mission statements already. But you as an individual at a site, if you are in management, you have some oversight. You have some ability to, to say what happens in a specific program. Um, and I see that very markedly. I've been to lots of different neighborhood house um, centers down in South Bay primarily, and they all have very different flavors. One has a huge, huge, gorgeous um, outdoor garden kitchen that started about 15 years ago, but which has since kind of been a model for a lot of different programs in San Diego that I've wanted to do kind of a food to table. It started in the specific um, head start down in South Bay where the cook was really passionate about it. The director was really passionate and they were able to kind of start this gardening program that really had not been seen on a larger scale before. And that's because she knew and she, she knew that she had some limitations. She's head start. There are going to be things that she can and cannot do, but she still has vision and leadership within her own, within her own um, site as well. And I want you guys to embrace that. If you maybe are in the, in the spot right now where you maybe feel like you don't have a lot of control or in a position where you feel like you don't have a lot of oversight, you can control some things in your situation and examining what you can and cannot do and planning it into what you want to do in the next year is really a great place to start. So yearly fam a planning, depending on who you are, it's going to be either really informal, like you have a vision board and you have things scribbled or you have a whiteboard in the corner of your office and you kind of have notes and things like that to the margin, or it can be very established and prescribed. You have spreadsheets and you have planners and you have e-planners and everybody's you know on these google calendars um it's really who you are and how you plan how you learn um best is really going to inform you at you're the leader you get to make those types of decisions as long as it's communicated to your staff and things get done i don't care how planning looks it's really the act of doing it and making sure that you are hitting your goals so that you can finally achieve your vision I think the biggest thing, and I think something that we are great in, for the most part, is planning for families and family events. So as a working parent, I really appreciate knowing in advance for closures and events. And it's actually something I see more at my two-year-old school, more than at my elementary school and the after-school program. Um, that is where sometimes those school closures and PTO meetings and things like that happen at the very last minute. And as a working parent, that's really, really struggling for me to get all my ducks in a row but I do see it more at preschool. If, and I'll show you more how I do this. Um, what I see when it comes to families and family events is not planning budget-wise. So if you know that you're gonna have a large event where you need more brochures, then you're gonna need to also put aside a pot of money to have more brochures made up or to cover the cost of printing costs. It's more been with our budget-wise. I think meeting the needs of our families, we're good at communicating, but sometimes we're not good at setting aside those funds that we need to do or setting aside more funds so that our events are a little bit more successful and we have maybe better food or something. I like to schedule and decide on my topics for staff meetings, trainings, and orientations with my staff well ahead of time as well. As far as, far as orientations, I, especially in the Marine Corps, I had um, a lot of time, which was fantastic. And I know not all programs have that for new staff, um, but I did have a very prescribed set of what I had all of my teachers do before um, they could enter into the classroom as like a real employee. Um, they had kind of a training period and I had it written out so that anybody could see it. So if I was on vacation when somebody knew staff started, they could go through each sheet and policy and they kind of knew um, as a management team, we had come up with these really, really big ideas that we wanted to hit on over and over and over again, ratio, supervision, all of that type of stuff, in addition to reading our mission statement and going through and talking through it as well. I also had a couple videos that I showed as well, and then I always had copies of all of the paperwork that they needed to sign just in case as well. I had a couple binders on my shelf. Everybody knew where they were, um, but I typically did all of the training. That was my job on the Marine Corps, and then afterwards as a um, as um, running a state uh, funded program as well. I thought that even though we had a human resources department, I needed to welcome, welcome somebody into my own site uh, where maybe we did things, a slight variation different or things that I really wanted to emphasize as, as important at my particular site because of the community that I served. Um, so I also had typically had um, topics for staff meetings, of course, and then we do have to be reactive. If we get hit real bad on licensing, we're going to have to go over that at a staff meeting and not do something else that I had planned. Um, but I typically knew because I always knew, like, oh, we always talk about um, 
child abuse or, you know, tech is a big issue, but I kind of had a, a rotating list of things that I wanted to cover as far as staff meetings. Um, and then I did like to com uh, consult uh, support staff about changes and issues. And when I talk about su support staff in this class, I'm talking about the people that we're lucky to have. So janitors or maintenance workers, um, our kitchen staff, uh, any office staff that we might have, like administrative assistants. We're lucky enough to have um, human resources departments or consultants, lawyers on consultancy as well, um, or anybody who supports the program. Not all of those programs have it, especially smaller FCC programs might not have this, and some smaller businesses as well. Um, smaller programs that maybe only have two to three classrooms of children might not have this luxury as well. But if you do, it's a really great idea to talk to your support staff about changes you're going to make or issues that they're facing as well. So if they're really struggling with um, fake grass out on your playground and they know it's going to need to be replaced in the next four years, you having that on your radar. Okay, I can't get it to in the next two years, but I'm anticipating having better funding in three. Or I need to start putting money into that pot each year or each month as I get a little bit extra money from higher enrollments in order to cover the cost of a new roof or to get the place tinted or to have the grass replaced, you know, something like that. Um, so that you kind of have those contingency funds and knowing about it from the people who are on the ground, like your janitor, um, who are looking at it will really help you be able to make those changes yourself. The biggest thing too, and I'm going to talk more about money um, in the next class, is um, the annual budget and yearly planning. Um, I think that this is an area where especially people who don't touch money on a daily basis, and what I mean, not that you're not taking money from parents, but maybe you don't have a lot of control at this moment with your annual budget, doesn't mean that you shouldn't be aware of money um, and you shouldn't be able to track um, how enrollments might ebb and flow or um, when things are due within your larger organization because maybe you notice that every February that your entire organization is tapped out. There is no money. Eventually you might figure out that that's when Discovery Isle pays all of their balloon payments or their liability or something like that. And so knowing in February I'm never going to have a lot of money, then in June when you do start getting money, then you can start asking for things and maybe put aside some monies or put it a, a more likely put away supplies so that you can use it in the winter when maybe there's less money. So looking at the annual budget, and if you do have control of it, what do I literally actually make to the penny? What am I bringing in? What is going out? How do I use that with my yearly planning? And then if you have less control of it, still being aware of the fact that your ability to run a program is based um, on money and the money that you receive from enrollments, either from the state, county, or from the family them themselves. So this is an example of yearly planning. I love examples. I give a lot of examples. So this is just kind of a pretend center that I plucked out of my mind that's really established. So you've been in business five to six years. You've been the director for quite a few years. There's always staff turnover within our industry, but you've had the kind of a core group of people within classrooms. Things are going well. You don't feel like you're a new or an inexperienced program. This is an example of how I might roughly plan out my year, and I'll go through it step by step, and you'll see that I'm hitting lots of different areas. I'm hitting staff, I'm hitting straight training, I'm hitting money, I'm hitting parents, I'm hitting community events and staff workshops as well. So in January, and you can start at whatever month you'd like, January, typically January, September, you know, kind of those months that we all think of like a fresh or new start. So I'm starting in January. My, um, my goal for this month is to have my annual budget, budget finalized. So I'm looking at the previous year, how much money did I literally, like I said, to the penny make, how much went out, um, what, how can I make changes? Once again, is there something really big that I'm going to need to pay or is there going to be a roof in a couple of years? So I'm going to sit down and I'm going to finalize that with all of my spreadsheets, looking at my actual money costs. Then I'm going to sit down with my other co-administrators, either at my program or at, with my program director or other site supervisors, and we're going to plan vacations. Um, I think this is important so you're not all trying to take the week of Jul the month of July off at the same time. People get summer vacation or winter vacation or whenever people want to be off, um, but it's also staggered so that there is enough management to cover as well. All right, then we're also loosely going to plan our monthly workshops or our monthly trainings for our staff and families as well. In February, we're going to have a parent workshop on art and creativity, so I know that I need to have extra money for paint and paper supplies in order to do the workshop with the family. 
In March, we're having a staff development day. So I'm reminding parents it's a half day. We're gonna close half uh, at noon on a Friday in order to spend time working on some staff development as well. Also this month, we're gonna pay for CPR and first aid to be done on two Saturdays. In April, I know that my program is paying liability and we're also paying our insurance money, so there's no extra money for supplies or anything like that. I'm gonna let my staff know actually in March, if you need anything, I can give you a little bit of money now, but when April hits, we're really gonna have to spend a lot of our money focusing on this. In May, I'm gonna finish my school age summer camp activities. We have a, uh, like a, a gymnasium style room. Um, and so in the summer, we do a small school age program for children who are out of summer. Um, so we need to finalize what the camp activities are gonna be, if we're gonna do any field trips or if we're gonna have people come in. And then I'm also gonna to go to the local universities and colleges and see if I can hire more temporary student staff for those months as well. And I need to start doing that in May so that that first by first or second week of June, I have my staff in place for my school age program. In June, the center is gonna be planted outside. I can't switch it to any other month. So I know that that's going to be um, a long week uh, with my school age already up and running and also with all of my kids inside, it's gonna be a long week. I'm gonna to try to put some extra money towards um, going to the Target dollar spot and getting crafts and activities, maybe having somebody come in and do balloon animals, um, clearing one room so maybe we can do some bike riding or something like that um, because it's gonna be a long week with the kids inside. In July, we're having a staff meeting to discuss um, changes in vacation time and health insurance. So we have staff meetings every month, but this one is gonna be extra important because we're gonna have some changes. I have a HR consultant who's gonna come in and she's gonna talk about it at the staff meeting with me. Um, and then she's gonna schedule follow-ups with, with all staff afterwards. Sometimes um, staff members don't wanna ask questions in front of their management team. They'd rather talk to their HR consultant or vice versa, they don't wanna to talk to their HR consultant but they wanna to talk to me. Either way, making yourself available so that they can kind of process new changes when it comes to human resources and the amounts of money that they pay. In August, we're just gonna have fun. We're gonna have a staff pool party. We're gonna have um, street tacos and catering um, and we'll be playing games. It's part of our you know, monthly staff meetings, staff workshops, but we're just focusing on having fun and team building before we start back into another academic year. Um, so I know that I need some money for that as well. And then I'm gonna remind parents, um, starting in August, maybe even in July, that we're having our new registration fees coming into effect in September, and they are $5 more than they were last year. So I'm gonna start reminding parents about that now. The ones that I've already identified that might be having issues with paying it, um, we'll start talking to them a little bit earlier about payment plans. I know that that's going to be an issue for some of our families that struggle with that. In October, we're going to do all of our environmental rating scales for our infant and toddler rooms, our preschool rooms, and our after-school programs as well. So we're going to do some self-evaluation, and then we're also going to um, do a self-evaluation for ourselves. I do have a good team already who have done multiple um, environmental rating scales. The new staff will be either trained by the more established staff, or I will train them as well, but all of the classrooms do them and engage in a process of self-reflection, and we do a plan of action as well. And that's in October so that November we can still finalize it and get it going. And then in December we make some plans that we might want to do once again in January, changes that we might need to make to our classrooms. In November we're having parent-teacher conferences and how it's structured at our program is that I move staff schedules around so that they are, they're, our staff, our um, Parent-teacher conferences are not in the middle of the day. We have many working families, so they're typically very early in the morning or, or later in the evening afternoons, and so we move st staff schedules around. So I might be paying more money, um, or I might just be changing a lot of staff schedules in order to meet the needs and still have parents come to these conferences. In December, I'm going to start reminding my parents at the beginning of the month that the center will be closed for one week in between Christmas and New Year's. And in that time, I'm going to have um, uh, the carpet cleaners come in, and I'm also going to have a window washer come in as well. There's extra money that I have um, budget-wise, and I'm also going to see if staff wants to come in and not work specifically on their classrooms, but work on taking tables outside and scrubbing them, um, going out and scrubbing the um, playground equipment, um, maybe uh, fluffing up the fake grass that we have, so kind of things as a center as for our center as a whole. 
So once again, this is an example of all the ways that I would hit budget, families, special events, team building. There's a lot of different things and a lot of different topics because I think that's really evocative of our program as a whole. We're never just worried about budget and we're never just worried about staff and we're never just worried about children. We're worried about all of those types of things. And this, as I said, doesn't even go into accreditation. It doesn't go into licensing, any of those reactive things that we would have to do in the moment. This is just my best case scenario at the start of the year. What am I going to do for the next 12 months? When are things due and what do I need to be concerned about? So I also wanted to include an example of some staff workshops that I would plan. So sometimes I'll put them into the, what I did in that previous slide. So into my whole year, it's kind of built into it. Sometimes though, I would have to, especially if I had a new team, and that's why I call it back to basics. Maybe I've had a lot of turnover. Maybe I've lost some uh, established um, staff members to retirement. Maybe I'm new myself. Maybe we've struggled with health and safety like we totally get this awesome regio project-based approach waldorf everything but our health and safety kind of fell off the radar and we got hit by licensing like 100 percent, it's happened to all of us at some point or another licensing hits us for something but that's kind of showed me a bigger issue that in our quest towards this awesome curriculum that we're doing we forgot about some of the basics so we've got to get back to the basics so in that type of situation or just I like to have it written out. I will do some yearly planning just about my staff and what I want to work on my staff with. A lot of times staff meetings, and we'll go more into this, don't really work so well because we haven't thought about it. So we've all sat through those kind of long meetings. They're typically on a Friday afternoon. Everybody's worked. You just want to get home. Um, and we'll go more into ways, some ways that we can perk up those types of meetings. Um, but typically, I've noticed as a, somebody who's worked in the field and now is a community college instructor and university instructor, you do have to put some more planning into it. You can't just on Friday morning be like, oh shoot, I forgot, and like make off some copies of an article real fast and expect that that meeting's gonna go well. If you are the leader and moderator of an event, you actually have to put in quite a lot of work. For a staff meeting, I would spend two to three times the length of the, the meeting working on it. So if the meeting was one hour, I typically spent three to four hours working on things that I wanted to talk about, finding multimedia sources, going through um, the important like housekeeping things that I needed to get through, all of those types of things. And we'll go more into how we can sh do staff meetings and then we'll also uh, later in the class plan for parent workshops. And I consider parent workshops and staff workshops fairly much a little bit similar. Um, in that, you know, you kind of have to plan for multiple learners and you are teaching somebody something new and you have to put some thought into the agenda. But in the meantime, this is how macro level, once again, at the start of the class, this is how I would plan for health, safety, and just back to basics for maybe a new team that's starting to form. In January, in our monthly staff meeting, we go over supervision and ratios. I play a couple of videos about it. We talk about scenarios. So if um, you really need to pee and you're going to be over ratio if you're able to leave the classroom, like what should you do? So it'll reinforce what your policies and procedures are and give them some harder real life examples that you've gone through instead of just saying, never, never get out of ratio. Like what happens if something's come up and you might go out of ratio? What should you do then? All right. And then February, we're going to talk about Eckers training. So I'm going to train all the staff in Eckers. So we're going to go through the environmental rating scales bit by bit by bit, and I'm going to show them how to do it. In March, they're going to do the Eckers in their classroom. So we're not going to have a staff meeting, but we're going to have some staff members come through and relieve people out of the classroom so that they can either rate their own scale, they can either rate their own classroom, or they can rate other people's classrooms. And that's a decision that you typically make by yourself or if you have a governing board that has specific oversight about that. And that really does have to play with your team dynamics as well. I've done it both ways. Uh, if somebody is fine with being assessed by other people, that's great. If it's something that's difficult for some staff members, you might want to consider them doing a self-assessment with you. So you might be bringing up some of those things that they need to think critically about, but maybe it's not opening them up to a reflection that they're not ready to do with other people. In April, um, and then the Eckers classroom, and then from there we'll go into April, we'll have a staff meeting, um, either individually classrooms as teams or age group teams, or as a whole, depending on the type of staff that you have, but we'll go over the Eckers and do plans of action together. Typically, I would bring everybody in as a group, um, so we'd have a longer, maybe two hour um, staff meeting, but I'd bring everybody together, we talk about a plan of action, 
What does it look like? And then I would dismiss them back into their classrooms to do the plan of action with management helping them. In May, we're also having our staff meet, meeting on family style dining, hand washing, and the importance of hand washing um, and cleanliness and things like that. In June, our monthly staff meeting is doing our CPR, and in July, it's doing our first aid, so having somebody come in and do that for us. And then on August, this is how I've always run my programs. You don't have to do it. August was always our like pool party, meet at the park, meet at somebody's house, um, or on a Saturday, come back to school and barbecue. You know, whatever we could kind of get our hands on if somebody had a pool that was willing to open up their house or things like that. Um, but you don't have to do it. Um, in the month that I did it, obviously, and you don't have to do it the way that I did it, but I think at least one event a month, if you do them regularly, should be just for team building and having fun and kind of recommitting to each other. In September, we're going to do lesson planning. In September, it's fresh. The, tar doc, the Target dollar spot has all the cute planning stuff. Talking about lesson planning, if you were, I was going to make any curriculum changes or I wanted to get my staff's feedback on curriculum changes, this would be the month that I would do it. In October, we're going to talk about customer service. We're not in an industry where the customer is always right. We do have some education that we provide for our parents about what's developmentally appropriate and what education for young children looks like. But how can we be polite, respectful, and provide the care that all children need? In December, once again, we're closed for one week, and I'm going to pay staff that wants any extra money to work in the classroom two to three days out of that week to clean and organize their classrooms in addition to scrubbing down playgrounds, underneath tables, chairs, pulling things out of their closets, things like that. So once again, this is yearly planning for maybe a new group that's getting together or if you are a new management team. A big thing that's going to um, inform our planning is assessment and evaluations. So I talked about evaluations and that included the environmental rating scale. If you're not familiar with the environmental rating scale, Palomar has a class on that. Um, I do, it is a really, really great, and it's very standard and most people know what it is because it's such a, a standard way that we um, assess our programs. If you haven't heard of it, take a look. There's a bunch of YouTube videos um, and there's also a lot of online resources as well. I do think that is a great way to look at and evaluate your program. It is not the only way. There are other things out there, but that's kind of the industry standard. We also are going to have, um, and I do like ECRS as well because it does affect your policies, your budget, and career complaining, which is a lot of what management has to do. So it's very rare within an environmental rating scale that um, the plan of action does not include things that management needs to do. Um, either things they need to order for you, but it also might include things that curriculum-wise they need from you, co printing costs, you know, things like that. Um, so I, that's why I think building Eckers into your yearly program it can be really important for you because you know that however many classrooms you have, you're going to have one to two um, action items from those classrooms that you need to work on in order for them to hit their Eckers. So if they don't have enough diverse books or pictures or something like that, then you know you're going to have to go to Lakeshore and pick up whatever they need, which is more money um, as well. Sometimes it will also come into a play that you don't have the, the policies that you need. And this is typically if you're doing NIAC accreditation or something like that, it'll come back to your policies and procedures. And maybe if you've been hit by licensing as well, that those need to be revised as well. Um, I also like self-assessments like the environmental rating scale because it's a good way in practical terms about what's actually in your classroom. Talk about their staff's thoughts on the program and the way that they can change things. So sometimes we have a staff member, and I don't want to say squeaky wheel, but somebody who's very vocal about what they want. And that's a good thing. We do want, as long as they're kind and respectful to us, and we'll be kind and respectful and listen to them about what they think the program needs. Sometimes we have quieter staff, though, who might have fantastic ideas, but is not being heard in that kind of way. So a self-assessment like this, like the environmental rating scales or anything, any process of assessment or evaluation might show their fantastic thoughts on ways to change policies or ways to flip their classrooms or change age ranges or something like that. So I think that engaging in a process of assessment and evaluation can be really positive on multiple uh, fronts. So I bring up this kind of quality pyramid, and it's from the National After School Alliance because this is kind of where we're headed with our yearly planning. Um, so once again, I'm really looking at that macro level in the beginning weeks of this class. So really what we're looking for is um, at the bottom of our pyramid, 
um, the kind of the more important, most important thing is well-trained caregivers. That's the foundation. So we need them to be really well-trained. And that's why I talked about in my year of planning, making sure that we have staff needs and trainings for our program, because we're not going to have a well-run program without really well, good caregivers and good educators working for us. We also want to, um, increase that bond, that nurturing and responsive relationships that we expect our um, staff to have with children. And then we want to have high quality environments, we want to target their social and emotional support, and then we want to provide intervention. So first, the, the top of the pyramid are things like the extras and things like that. It would be fantastic to have, but not every program has it. But I would expect that in our yearly planning, we are engaging in all of this yearly planning in order to have supportive environments, in order to have high quality education, in order to increase the nurturing and responsive relationships between our staff and our children, and to have an effective workforce that follows policies and procedures in order to be the best educators they can. So that's our ultimate goal is we're putting our vision into action and our vision, vision in some sense is going to include these three things. And that's why we're engaging in the process of self-reflection and planning. So program organization and management is part of those building blocks for a quality program. They underpin the daily workings of our program. So our policies and procedures support the everyday working of a program, and that might need something that needs to be reworked in your yearly planning. Once again, how can we support different types of teachers, and how can management support them? So everybody probably has that teacher who's so fantastic. She's like the most amazing educator you can drink like you think of an educator in your mind and you make this person appear in the classroom but then they're not very good at like the management like papers always go missing or they're stuffed into things and their classroom is always a little bit disorganized and you know the school's not gonna run that well unless we kind of pull that teacher along with us and her policies and procedure and her classroom management comes along as well. Um, and that's where management can come in and can really help with policies, procedures, and rules. They can help support her so that she can get or he can get that classroom um, running enough so that the education is happening and it's happening so well and then those policies are happening as well so that the families and staff feel supported as well. But once again, that bare minimum of the program the thing that we have to be most concerned with and that base of the pyramid is meet licensing requirements, that health and safety, making sure that we're not getting hit by licensing. Um, so this is a lot of collaboration between um, and then support from management and staff. So management is supporting staff, staff is complying with programs, um, goals, vision, um, and then the policies, procedures, and rules as well. So that is it for this week. This is the end of the program planning uh, lecture video. The next one is on curricular choices. Have a great week.